as you come, you can open your Bibles to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is just past the midway point in the Bible, if you're new to the Bible. In my Bible, it's page 737. Uh, but basically, if you turn to the midway point, then go right a few different books you'll see, and then eventually you'll reach the book of Daniel in your Bible. We are starting a series in this book. Our practice as a church is to take a section of the Bible. They're called books in the big book, which is the Bible, and to just walk through it and study it, examine it. It's, it's called, technical term is exegetical preaching. We just look at the Bible and then ask, what, what is God speaking to us? And, and this book has been one we've been looking forward to for some time, to just enjoying the message of this book. It is a magnificent book. It takes a little bit of, of hard thinking. It's got some parts to it that are not obvious and clear at first reading. You have to study it a little bit, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but more than anything, it's a, a book about the greatness and the supremacy of our God. It's about the King of all kings. That's really the big point of Daniel. There is a king above all kings, and our calling is to keep our eyes fixed on him. Before we read this opening chapter, I, I wanted to take a, a moment uh, in, in advance of the message, if I can say it that way, and just address uh, maybe some, some pastoral recommendations after the election. These are going to relate to my message, but uh, just by way of introduction, and actually part of the reason we're doing this book of Daniel was because of the election process and some of the opportunities and temptations that the church faces in this kind of a cultural moment. Aaron and I were just talking this week about observing some of the, the cultural reaction that's taking place, even among Christians, online, Facebook, obviously you're watching the news, and it brought to mind three different, maybe if I could say it, points we need to remember as we respond or as we watch responses to the election that took place. Three different things we need to remember. These are just pastoral recommendations for you to consider as you're reading Facebook, as you're interacting with other people, Christian and non-Christian, as you're watching people interact online and maybe participating in some way. Three things to remember. First of all, God. Always good to start with God. But let me encourage you that in a particular way, this election and the post-election responses and evaluations and reactions often lack any reference to God. So there's a lot of talk about pragmatism and what's better or worse, or what's the right reaction, or let's compare this reaction to reactions four years ago, and a lot of talk, not all of which, not much of which focuses on God is sovereign, God is good, God is the point of all of history, God is the greatest thing that Christians should be concerned with. Again, I'm not, I'm not against political conversations, I have them analyzing, dissecting, why did this happen and not did this happen? totally legitimate to do that, but let's not let those lesser conversations displace our discussion of God. God-centeredness must be the foundation of any political conversation we would have. Recommendation number one. Recommendation number two, holiness. Holiness. It's basically a political cliche at this point to say that no candidate is perfect. And so when you talk politics, you're automatically entering a relative world. It's relatively the case that some candidates might be better than others. It's relatively the case that some people might be more righteous than others. That's a relative conversation. By relative, I mean it's comparing small things in terms of themselves. My son plays with little army soldiers, little plastic army soldiers. Relatively, some of them might be bigger or smaller than others, might have a different position than others, but it's relative. The holiness of God is absolute. It's not relative. And one recommendation that I would have in just observing the reaction, even among Christians, we don't want to relativize holiness. We might have a, an opinion that in a relative world, a particular candidate, a particular platform is better or worse than another candidate. I think legitimate to do. We live in a fallen world. Uh, this is not heaven on earth, okay? However, sometimes Christians, 
in defending their particular candidate can talk more about how one is relatively better than the other and can be a little less direct in upholding the absolute standards of holding. So we don't want to do that. I'm saying you can or can't vote for someone that's imperfect. You have, that's the only kind of people we vote for, is imperfect people. However, people in the world need to hear Christians clearly say, this immorality is immoral. This position is against God's word. This statement is offensive, if it is, according to Scripture. If we don't say those kinds of things, we run the risk of relativizing the very nature of our identity as Christians. I'm not saying we can't argue for relative better or worse, but let's also point out when something is evil, let's say it's evil, even if that evil happens to reside in a candidate we think might be better or worse. Third word, grace. Grace. And what I mean by grace is that we realize we are the recipients of the grace of God displayed towards us as sinners. It's been remarkable to me the amount of judgmental self-righteousness that explodes after an election. Amazing. And even Christians give in to that kind of thing. A lack of sort of compassionate understanding towards others, their their viewpoint or perspective can be dismissed. Even their proclamations of suffering or fear can be dismissed, disregarded. It is possible to disagree with someone politically and yet have grace towards them as a person. Very important to distinguish that. I might disagree with the person as to the best political solution or the right way to govern the nation and so forth, but that doesn't mean I dismiss their experience of fear or suffering or difficulty or their outrage in a particular situation. There should be this ability to disagree graciously, humbly, kindly, compassionately not dismissing those who have faced experiences that I have never faced. There should be this humility towards them. Not the idea that all opinions are equally valid, equally wise, equally right, but a, an internal disposition. I've received the grace of God. Therefore, even if I think you're totally wrong, I can still be gracious and loving towards you. Just three things to bear in mind. And I imagine if you're on Facebook or you're watching interactions, you might notice at times one of those things seeming to drift from the conversation among Christians. Is God being magnified as the center of all things in this conversation? Is holiness being promoted regardless of who falls under the negative assessment of holiness? Is grace being expressed even when we disagree? Important things to bear in mind, and certainly as our church, let's be a light and a witness to those three realities. When we're interacting, when we're having conversations, email, Twitter, let's, let's reflect God, holiness, grace, as we're following up on what inevitably is going to be a lengthy conversation. Let's, let's, let's fulfill our responsibility before the Lord to do those three things. I, I think in some ways what Daniel is going to do is to help us, it's going to motivate us to do those three things. It's going to magnify for us the greatness of God. It's going to help us not to be indifferent or disinterested in the real life of people living in this nation and think about what's the best way for Christians to serve this country. Daniel himself does that. But more importantly, it's going to reveal the greatness of our God and keep our eyes focused on so let's keep our eyes focused on the King of Kings. And as we read this for a chapter, I, I want to give a little bit of a hint of what I think is the, the subtle but explosive point. If you remember some of those uh, little um, find the cat pictures you did when you were a kid or find the dog, you know, here's a picture. Find the dog. How many dogs are there in the picture? Well, this Daniel chapter 1 is a little bit like that with this as the question. Where is the true king? 
Where is the true king? It's subtle. It's not obvious. It's not seen on the surface. Where is the true king? Let's read this whole chapter, and then we'll examine it together. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding and learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward and the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let your appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none, none was found, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters who were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. One of my sons um, at times has displayed a, a an interest, I think it's just God-given interest in God and asking questions, as many children do, they ask questions. And, and I remember one time, and he's done this multiple times, he asked a question, well, Daddy, but why can't I see God? Why can't I see God? A lot of kids have the same question. And I told him, son, your eyes don't work very well. Your eyes don't work very well, but God can see you. Why can't I see God? Your eyes, they don't work very well. But God can see you. Our eyes don't work very well. They see physical things. They see people. They see physical power like spears and guns and tanks. They see positions like the office of president or your boss. They see physical difficulties like the loss of a house and 
physical disease and sickness and weakness. Our eyes can see those things. But they don't work very well. Because there are real things bigger and greater and even more fundamental than those things that we need to see. The things that we most need to see on our own, we can't see because our eyes don't work very well. What Daniel is doing in writing this chapter and really the entirety of the book is to give us better eyes. He's writing this to give us better eyes. Your eyes don't work very well, but there is a thing on earth that can give you new eyes, and these new eyes allow you to see what you need to see. Not what you see naturally with our weak eyes, but what you need to see. And God's word does that. Psalm 19 says the, the law of the Lord, it enlightens the eyes as though on our own we see things in the dark and God turns the light on. That's what we need in the book of Daniel. Now, I'm going to basically frame our discussion about this chapter into three questions. Three questions. Three times in this chapter, God is said to give something. And in those three gifts that he gives, our eyes are allowed to see what we need to see. And it's, it's amazing how when Daniel writes this book, he, he writes it and describes almost all of what's happening in terms of what our eyes naturally see. And so the book itself is almost like a lived out parable of life. It's, it's almost like, this is what you normally see, normally see, normally see. And let me give you a little hint of what you should see. It, it, it's described the way we normally think, except with a little hint, a little gleam of what we need to see. It allows us to peer behind the curtain and see what's actually going on. He does it three times in the, in the passage, and he allows us to see what's happening. The first is in verse 1 and 2. Here's the question I would ask. Who gave the exile? Question number one, to help us understand what is Daniel doing here. The Old Testament narratives, important to understand, the Old Testament narratives, when we're reading our Bible, they are not merely historical lessons so that I know about Daniel and that makes me a good Christian. They're not merely historical facts and figures. They're stories that intend to make a point, stories that intend to help us see. So one danger we have whenever we look at the Old Testament is to assume this is just his history. I'm supposed to know this. Uh, it's kind of part of my Christian education. You have to take history class. You got to know about Daniel. Pass your test. Okay, good. No, not at all. But the other danger we have is to assume that all of the Bible is written exactly the same. And so we read Daniel like we might read Ephesians. We read it and we're looking for the law or the command. And this is just talking about people. So we assume, well, the main point must be find a person and be like them. So where's Daniel? I'm supposed to be like Daniel. Where's, my, where's the hero I'm supposed to be like? Because I'm looking for a command. I'm looking for a point. I'm looking for a calling. And, and those things are in the stories. But to look primarily for the command, like we would in Ephesians maybe, is to miss the way a story works. It works like a story. Read it. Read it like a story. And the point of the story is not firstly find the person you're supposed to be like and then imitate everything they do. The point of the story is to find out who is the hero. Where's the surprise in this story? Where does it turn? Where does it shock you? Where does the unexpected take place? And the first place the unexpected takes place is in verse 2. The Lord gave. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. Notice, when we're going through this passage, do you notice how many times the word king is used? You notice that? King Jehoiakim, right? And then King Nebuchadnezzar. Later on it says the king's food and the king's table. The king, the king, the king is used over and over and over again. And it's not surprising because when we look out at the world, we're very aware of kingly people. We see king and king this and president that and governor this and officer that. We see positions, and that's exactly what happens in the normal description here. This is taking place, this event is taking place about 600 B.C., so this is 600 years before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's maybe 400 years after uh, David and Solomon ruled, 
And so the people of Israel have declined greatly. And part of the covenant that God made with them, that old covenant he made with the people of Israel uniquely, was that he promised if they abandoned him, they would basically eventually be punished by being thrust out of the land the way Adam and Eve were. That their sinfulness would necessitate them being exiled away from his temple and away from his presence, and they would be sent away and put into a land of captivity. And that is what's taking place here. Jehoiakim, the, the last in a long line of kings, is given, it says, into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar. He's the king of Babylon. This was the world empire at the time. And he's given into his hand. And you want to notice also, not just that the king was given into his hand, it means that he was put in his power. Notice also that some of the vessels of the house of God were taken, and notice they're taken to the land of Shinar. Now, if you remember some of your early parts of the Bible, remember the land of Shinar was the place where people gathered to defy God in the Old Testament. So Daniel speaking to Jewish people, he's, he's pointing out that what's happening here is a part of a broader, larger biblical storyline. God's people are being put into the hands of God's enemies. Because of their sin. Their sin in pursuing idols and rejecting God has eventually led to where they're going to get what they wanted and they're put in the land of those who reject God and worship idols. And they're put there as prisoners. Because sin always leads to prison, spiritually. We want to notice this little phrase about how God gave the king so that behind the greatest ruler in the world is a greater ruler. Behind the one with the vast army, capable of swallowing up nations, even mighty Egypt was defeated by Babylon. Behind that ruler is another hand that's just giving his people to Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, the real thing we need to see, the real thing that our eyes might miss because they don't work very well, is that Nebuchadnezzar didn't take Jerusalem. It was given to him. He didn't take God's people. It was given to him. Now, this is frightening and sad for God's people that their sin has led them to this point where God is handing them over to this pagan ruler. But it also brings to mind the promise that is ultimately comforting. God will fulfill his covenant. And this covenant guaranteed exile. But it also guaranteed hope that the exile would not be permanent. And so the same God who fulfills his promise of exile, even in the fact that there's an exile, is indicating that his covenant will take place Regardless of people, regardless of their weakness, regardless of the apparent power of Nebuchadnezzar, God is the one who is bringing about his covenant to his people. He will bring about the exile, and even in that painful disciplinary judgment, there is this hope. And, and he promises an end of an exile as well. Who gave the exile? Now, I think the church today needs this point in Daniel. We need this point because our eyes don't work very well and we're prone to see human rulers and human figures and human parties and to exaggerate their power and influence. Whereas here, God pictures Nebuchadnezzar as, as someone just holding his hands up and God gives the, the nation of Israel into his hand. But let's imagine the modern day equivalent of that. God chooses nations to rise, to fall. God chooses leaders to have and to lose. God chooses people to receive and to give up. God is behind the apparent successes and failures of rulers and kings and nations. God, not even Nebuchadnezzar, has power on his own. All that he has comes from God. And he will find that out later in this book. All that he has. The book of Daniel processes through a number of rulers. It's, it's very focused on this idea of, 
of worldly leaders. And again and again and again, it makes this point. No power except what the Lord gives. No power except what God decides you will have. No permanence because when God says you're done, you're done. Again and again and again, this book points out you that have apparent power are only given power because the Lord has given it to you. We, we, you can only imagine Jesus when he's standing before Pilate having Daniel on his mind when he says, you would have no power over me unless it was given to you from the Lord. The church needs to keep our eyes on the king of kings absolutely sovereign over the most sovereign king on the earth. There's an irony in this passage. This great, grandiose King Nebuchadnezzar is just given something like a child. Who gave the exile? God did. You also want to notice, this beginning paragraph is just so important, that's why I'm lingering on it. You also want to notice that the, the articles of God's house are taken and put in the house of, of the pagan idol of Babylon. You notice down there? He brought some of the vessels of the house of God and brought them into the house of his God. Very important that our modern eyes don't just skip over what's happening here. This is a, this is a crucial point. God's house represented God himself. The articles of that house represented God. And in this culture, to take over a nation symbolically, representationally, was to proclaim your God is not strong enough to protect you. So when he takes these vessels, it's as though he's taking God himself, the God of Israel, Yahweh, and he's putting him in the possession of his God. It's as though he's saying, your glory and power I put subordinate and in the possession of my God. My God is greater than yours. That's the reputation hit to Yahweh that he receives by those passages. God is not able to protect his own reputation. It's taken into captivity. Now for a Jew who believes in the power and greatness and uniqueness of God, this is surprising. Why does God allow, why does he allow his own reputation to be scuttled because of his people's sin? Why does God allow his own glory to be mixed up with the exile that his people endure? Why does God do that? Why didn't God just allow the people to be taken and somehow preserve his own glory? Or why did he just wipe them out himself? Why does God allow this to be put into his word, that his own articles get to be maligned by being placed in this pagan temple? It's surprising. It's, a, it's really a shocking statement of God's perspective about his people. Tremper Longman says this, Once again, from a human perspective, the plundering of the temple of the Lord even if at this time only some of the articles were taken and placed in the Babylonian temple, eventually the temple would be destroyed. They could be seen as a great victory, not only over Israel, but over Yahweh himself. Apparently, God's commitment to his people is such that in the fulfillment of this exile, he positions himself along with them as they experience his own punishment for their sin. Now, if you've read the New Testament, you should be thinking about the ultimate culmination of that trajectory. Shouldn't you? What's the ultimate culmination of an Old Testament trajectory that says God's own reputation is dragged into exile because of his people's sin? What's the ultimate culmination of that pattern? Well, where else do we see God's own reputation dragged into a kind of exile because of the sin of his people? Well, we see it on Calvary when God himself in the flesh is dragged into an exile out of the city of Jerusalem and even out of God's own presence because of his people's sin. So in this dragging of the temple into the very temple of the false god, we, we see kind of a, a, 
a pre-reading of what would happen with Jesus. The cross was the apparent victory of evil over Yahweh. When in fact, Yahweh gave the Son to die for his people's sin. It was the apparent victory of Satan over the covenant God, when in fact, God was the one who willed him to suffer and to be taken captive like a lamb before it shears. There's so much in Daniel that that anticipates, this exile just anticipates how will God finally save this sinful people. Their sin has to be sent away from him, but at the same time, he's linked himself to them and he will not let them go. Well, that problem is ultimately resolved at the cross of Jesus Christ. Their sin is sent away from him, but at the same time, he will not let them go. So he takes their sin on himself, and he sends himself, as it were, into exile so that they can be rescued. As it were, he goes into exile for them so that they can be brought back into their homeland. Yahweh allows himself to be be the object of, of worldly scorn and mockery to appear as though he is weak and helpless before the power of evil. And the same Yahweh who did it in Daniel's time did it 600 years later when Jesus went to the cross. Keep your eyes on the King of Kings. Second question, who gave the favor? Who gave the favor? We're told in verses 3 through 7 that the king, Nebuchadnezzar, wanted his chief eunuch, his servant, to bring some of the royal family, that would have been the family of Judah, the royal family, and to bring them into uh, his own service, to teach them. So the idea is we're going to teach and instruct these people. What they need is to get our wisdom and to teach and instruct them so that they can be useful in my service. We're going to inundate them, it says, with the knowledge and understanding of our people, of our culture, and we are going to provide for them. In other words, we're going to identify them as closely as possible with our culture, with our people. And you notice they do this even to the point of their names in verse 6. Did you notice that in verse 6? It says even their names are going to be changed. We don't know exactly what the names here mean, but what is clear is that they're being changed from identification with Yahweh to identification with Babylonian gods. That's the clearest thing we can see about. There's some dispute about what the names mean. What's clear is the Yahweh identification is being exchanged, and they're now going to be identified with the gods of Babylon. And more than that, they're going to be identified with the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar himself. What's what's Nebuchadnezzar doing here? He's saying, look, I win, I get the spoils, you now identify with me. And you're now going to serve me. And your best are going to serve me. The best you have are going to be servants in my house. And we're going to train you. There's a basically a statement of superiority, of ownership being taken place here. You, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, that used to belong to Yahweh, You belong to me. Guess whose king owns you now? Guess which king owns you now? Me. Your food comes from me. Your names. To name someone in this culture is to basically say you're taking possession of them. You own them. To name you is to say you belong to me. Your very identity belongs to me. So what do our broken eyes see when it appears as though all that is true about these people and their identity has just been taken from them? And they belong to this pagan ruler. Everything they could see said that even their own names have been changed. They now must answer to the names of allegiance of a foreign god. Their food comes from him. Their service comes from him. Their training comes from him. Now, Daniel decides he is going to stand against the apparent identity switch and reclaim or claim and state 
that he belongs to the Lord, that it is the Lord's favor that he is living for, that God is his owner, that God is his judge, and he's going to entrust himself to the Lord, whatever the consequences, because he believes that his king is king. So he says, in verse 8, Daniel resolved himself, that word could be, it's, he set it on his heart, that he would not defile himself, that's holiness language, with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Now, again, important not to read the Old Testament wrongly. I do not think that Daniel 1 is indicating that all meat is bad. I don't think that's the point of Daniel 1. The point of Daniel 1 is, Daniel decided, look, I will not identify myself with this cultural attempt to remove my identity as a Jew, as a faithful believer in God. I will not do it. And we don't know exactly what it was about the food that would have been defiling. Jews were allowed to eat meat. Uh, We don't know exactly what it was that was defiling. Certainly they were allowed to drink wine. So somehow Daniel saw in this food, whether it had been offered to idols perhaps, or somehow he saw this as a statement of identity. It was a bridge he would not cross. I will identify myself with God. I will not be exchanged for the pagan worshipers of this culture. I will not identify myself as ultimately belonging to this king. I think that's the main point of the story. I don't think we're supposed to peer in here and and be asking questions about what exactly we're supposed to eat and maybe what exactly were the vegetables that they ate and what exactly... No, no, the, the point is he took a stand to say... I belong to God. I trust myself to the king. My eyes see better. In verse 9, which is the center of this middle section, offers the clue. God gave Daniel faith and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. The writer of Daniel is just a genius from a literary standpoint as well. He writes the story the way we normally see life. And the way we normally see life, you reach verse 7, you say, well, you don't have a choice, man. What else could you do? I mean, what else could you do? I mean, you're captive. You're, I mean, just worship the Lord in private, but you, you don't have, you're a captive. This is a result of the Israelite sin anyway, so here you are in this foreign land, and you're you've been renamed, and everything about you is Nebuchadnezzar, right? You are his person. You're his property. Just fit in. Daniel says, no, I will not fit in to that degree that my identity is taken away. I belong to the Lord. I will not defile myself in this way, I will keep my identity of being set apart to God. I am Yahweh's man. I am not Nebuchadnezzar. What happens to the man who entrusts himself to God? God gives him favor. God gives him favor, it says. There's irony in this passage. It says that the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, Daniel I fear my lord the king. What's he afraid of? I'm going to give you vegetables, and you're going to look a little trim next week, and he's going to chop me down. And I don't like that, because, Daniel, in case you haven't noticed, this is the biggest, scariest dude to be aware of in this jungle, okay? This dude right here, uh, he's the one we fear. He's the one we worry about. But Daniel says, there's a bigger one. There's a bigger one to fear. There's a bigger one to worry about. Test me. Test me for 10 days. What does Daniel say? I'll put God... God compared to Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going with God every day. That's what he says. He says, I entrust myself to God. Before God, I stand and fall. I will stand before God, and he's the one I'm going to fear. He's the one I'm going to dread. I'm going to be set apart to the Lord And let's see what happens. And we already know what's going to happen because we have in verse 9 the hint. God gave 
Daniel favor. And then we have a description of what took place and only the invitation to see the source of it. It says, after 10 days, Daniel was fatter in flesh than the other youths, presumably other captives, who were eating the things from the king's table. Now, we don't want to read in modern health into this test, okay? This is not like, well, of course, because they ate less. Food. No, no, no. The point here is that this is a shocking reversal, okay? Culturally, that's the point. Which one is going to look fatter of flesh after a week? The green bean guy or the steak and potatoes guy? Okay, that's the question. And all of the cultural expectations said, that's a no-brainer. Obviously, these kids are going to look better. They got wine from the table. The outflow of Nebuchadnezzar's table is pouring into their bellies. And these guys are eating green beans. No question, they're going to look better. Everything we expect says that this type of diet will lead to a better appearance. Of course, because your eyes don't work very well. But Daniel sees God. And he says, living for the favor of God? Trust me. All of your assumptions, all of your presumed calculations but what always happens the way things always work this will certainly be the case no chance that you can look better at the end of 10 days he says they're irrelevant when you're talking about God and it turns out to be true whose favor really matters for all the fear of King Nebuchadnezzar what's going to happen what's going to happen to these guys are they going to get to the end of the week and they're looking skinny and so he chops them down for their defiance they're in the hands of the Lord. Who gives the favor? Nebuchadnezzar or God? We need this book because sometimes I think we can fall into living with what our eyes can see. And so we look at cultural favor and the sense that, well, look, you just got to live life. I mean, what do, you, what do you think? There's kind of a pragmatism that functions. Look, this is my boss, okay? I mean, he wants me to do this practice. It's not exactly ethical, but I mean... What are you going to do? You live in a, in a fallen world. Or, I, look, I'm going to school, and I know I'm not. it's not right before the Lord to use this kind of language, but that's what everybody else does. What do you expect me to do? This is just life, okay? You just got to kind of go with the flow. Or, you know, I know that it's, I don't I think it's probably totally right to watch this or to have this kind of relationship or to act this way, but, you know, that's what, I mean, it is just, the, if I don't do that, I'm going to risk alienating the favor of those who actually have power. That's exactly what it was like for Daniel. The eunuch said, look, I fear my lord the king. And Daniel said, I do too. We just see a different king. Holiness that actually looks to the king often demands distinction from a world who looks to a different king. The king of favor, the king of popularity, the king of safety, the king of keeping my job, the king of keeping my friends, the king of keeping my popularity, the king of keeping my health. What this chapter reveals is trust yourself. doesn't mean a lack of suffering. Daniel's in exile. He doesn't know how to turn out. He's saying the true king is the one who's favoring you. Really. Don't look at what your eyes see. Who gives the favor? God does. God does. Final question. Who gives the wisdom? Who gives the wisdom? Verse 17 says, as for these four youths, there it is again, down at your Bibles. There it is again. As for these four youths, God. God gave them. You want to notice in this passage, uh, along with all of the irony that's taking place, there's a great reversal that's taking place. Everything Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's doing, God does. You notice what Nebuchadnezzar said? Here's what we'll do. Bring them to us, we'll give them wisdom. Remember that? At the beginning of the chapter. Bring them to us, we'll give them wisdom. We will pour out our benevolent wisdom upon them, and we will lift them up. They'll be useful in our kingdom. 
insert royal we all the time, right? We, our kingdom will be magnified when we insert our wisdom into these youths, and they'll be in service in our palace. God undermines it all in verse 17. God gave them learning and skill. All literature and wisdom had understanding, it says, and visions and dreams. And then you see this ultimate reversal. He brings them before. And who has ten times more wisdom and understanding about every matter the king inquired of them? Who? These four guys. These four guys. He found them ten times better, not just than all the other the other captives, than all all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom, it says. Again, read this as a story. This isn't a promise that Christians will always be smarter than non-Christians, all right? It doesn't say, this isn't like, trust, if you teach your children the Bible, they will get 1,600 on their SAT, and they'll be smarter than all of their friends at school. No, that's not what it's saying. The point is about God. The point is, look, your wisdom you think you're going to give them is nothing It's a tenth. It's nothing compared to the wisdom that God can give them. God has the wisdom, Nebuchadnezzar, not you. God's the one that gives wisdom. God's the one that has wisdom. What's the point? Your eyes don't work very well. You look around and see, wow, he's really smart. He's impressive. He's a magician. He's an enchanter. He can interpret dreams. God says, just, I'm going to give wisdom to four young guys that don't even know the language. And here they are, more wisdom than all the enchanters and magicians of Babylon. What's the point? He's just building this case. The apparent power, favor, wisdom is all with Nebuchadnezzar. The actual power, favor, wisdom is all with the Lord. What he's saying, he's peeling our eyes away from these cultural assumptions. And we need this in our country because we're a visual age. And we see, we look around, we see power, wisdom, intelligence, impressive. Look at that guy's house. Look at that guy's score. Look at that guy's award. Look at that guy's paycheck. Look at the power all around us. And God says, your eyes don't see very well. Look beyond. Let the scriptures give you eyes to see. There is a wisdom that makes the wisdom of this world pale in comparison. God gives wisdom. Any wisdom they actually have is just a percentage. It's a portion of what God's wisdom is. We see this same pattern that God is the one with ultimate wisdom. To be true in the New Testament. Because God has a wisdom that is, it's not just better than the world, it's of a totally different plane than the world. A totally different scale. He's not just smarter. His wisdom makes this world's wisdom look foolish in comparison. That's what Paul says in in 1 Corinthians. He says, look, the wisdom of the world is foolishness. And the wisdom of the cross looks foolish to this world. What's the point for Christians? Look to the true king. Keep your eyes on the true king. This worldly wisdom, it sure seems impressive. I mean, they got a whole system here, guys. The Babylonian, have you checked out? I mean, they know how to interpret the liver and dreams, and they shake these rattly things, and then they know what the future is going to be. We should check. Maybe this, they've got something here. And God says, I give the wisdom. And the wisdom I give you, it's going to be ten times better than what they have. And in the New Testament, it's a million times better. It's on a different scale. Because this world cannot discern the wisdom of a crucified king. No earthly wisdom could have foreseen or predicted that Jesus Christ would exile himself to save his exiled people. No worldly wisdom could see that. No earthly wisdom could look out and say, oh, the king of kings, the one who has ultimate power, he will sacrifice himself to save his people. He will take their sin on himself. He'll allow his power to be revealed in weakness. He'll allow his grace greatness to be displayed the most prominently when he dies on a cross. As Paul says, Greeks seek signs, but we preach Christ crucified. Foolishness to the Greeks, offense to the Jews, for us, wisdom. But 
The pattern in Daniel is the same pattern we see in the scriptures. Your eyes, your natural eyes, they don't work very well. But through the Spirit, you're given new eyes. And we function in that vision. We live in it. We see what's really going on. Where the real power, favor, wisdom is. It belongs to the king. The true king. Where's the king? A lot of references to kings. Where's the true king? You notice this chapter ends with a reference to yet another king. Brilliant ending. It's the ultimate reversal in the passage. This passage, it's, it's just beautifully written from a literary... If you don't think of the Bible as literarily... I don't mean it's just like any other book. I mean it is a book, though it's not like any other book. But it is a book. And so the literature of this is brilliant. He takes, he takes King Jehoiakim, is basically placed in the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. So Israel has zero power, and Babylon is at the height of world domination. And, and then he, he takes their youth, and they're in captivity. They have nothing. And all of their identity is stripped from them. And it appears as though Nebuchadnezzar has the power. But then, surprisingly, the king's table can't produce the same fatness that vegetables produces. So the question is, which king has the better table? And then he keeps going. He says, well, there's wisdom, and their wisdom somehow is greater than all the magicians of Egypt. Well, which king has the better wisdom? And then we get to the end. Very subtly, it points me. King Cyrus was a Persian king. The Persians conquered the Babylonians. They destroyed their empire. And not only that, but Cyrus was the one predicted and chosen by God to send his people out of exile. Hmm. What's Daniel doing? Scarcely planted. Scarcely sown. Scarcely has your stem taken root in the earth. He blows on you and you wither. But the word of God stands forever. The beginning, the Israelites and the glory of Yahweh is in the dust pile. At the end, Nebuchadnezzar has been discarded and Cyrus one called to send God's people home has been elevated. What's the point? Keep your eyes on the true king. Keep your eyes on the true king. Don't be impressed. They seem so powerful right now. But you're not. So impressive right now. And you will not overcome. Think how encouraging this has been for Christians over the centuries facing persecuting governments and persecuting cultures and cultures that seek to assimilate them and remove their identity in the world. Now, it doesn't mean the absence of pain and suffering. This last verse also indicates that Daniel existed in exile all of these years. Seventy years in exile. God's purposes didn't happen swiftly. But they did come about. We need this in this country. One of the reasons we felt it was helpful to preach this book is that it reminds us that in a, not an identical way, but in a similar way, we also exist in a land that is not our homeland. We also are exiles. Peter says, you are elect exiles, chosen by God and placed in an exile in which you are not in your homeland. And like Daniel we can also keep our eyes on the king. And like Daniel, that king is still ruling over history and accomplishing his purposes on the earth. And like Daniel, that king has ultimate power. He has the favor we need and he has the wisdom we need. Like Daniel, we can look to our king and say, you are the king of kings and I trust in you to keep your covenant true. And unlike Daniel, we have even more evidence of how he would bring that covenant Because we have the testimony of our king going into his own spiritual exile to rescue us. We've seen the ultimate display of true power and apparent weakness. 
We've seen the ultimate revelation of true wisdom greater than the wisdom of this world. We have seen the ultimate revelation of the true king. I think Daniel wrote this book to remind us. Remember, your natural eyes, they don't work very well. That's why you can't see God all the time. That's why things happen, and you're not sure why they're happening, and they seem incredibly unjust and very frightening and difficult. When you think about your children and the culture, and you think about the power of those who love immorality and hate righteousness, and you think about the long-term progress of the nations and wonder what's what's going to happen to God's people. Might they face persecution and suffering? What's going to happen if I can no longer meet freely as a Christian? What's going to happen if my testimony gets me to lose my job? Or what's going to happen if I, I can't follow without experiencing cultural backlash? What's going to happen? And Daniel says, it's all happened before. Don't be afraid. Don't be assimilated. Don't assume that you need the favor of Nebuchadnezzar and God. Keep your eyes on the true king. He's the king of kings. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for our church that you would allow us over the years, over the decades, over the centuries be faithful to the true king. And I pray that this pulpit will always proclaim heavenly wisdom. But I pray that every Christian Lord, that we've present member in this church, and I pray that we would all seek hard after you. Lord, I pray you would allow us to resist and reject the anxiety that comes from looking only at the world, from fearing only the world. And I pray you would reveal to us through your word, your ultimate supreme greatness. But we are in exile in the sense that we are not in our homeland. But one day, Lord, you will bring us home. We keep our eyes fixed on that homeland. Help us to set our hearts on you. In Jesus' name.